Hey, welcome to the Citizen Mike Show. Thanks for tuning in. We do appreciate it. My name is Mike Berdinsky, and somewhere sharing that split screen with me is Sam Carmody and Joe Marone, Wallingford Town Councilors. Guys, thanks for coming on the show. And Sam, welcome to your debut, I guess. You know, <laughs> right? Well, thank you for ha- thank you for having me, Mike. Okay, I, I hope that cheerful attitude lasts, you know, for the for the rest of the episode. Hey, look, um, you had a serious night on Tuesday night. That was May 10. Uh, you, you voted on the budget, and um, I think we're trying. We're all smelling a veto of it. Let me just give you a, a quick overview of what I know about it um, from published reports a little bit. But it, it you made some changes to. Um, reduce the tax bill of a typical Mm -hmm. property tax payer. Um, You reduced it, uh, according to my math, about, um, well, the mayor would have have increased it uh, by $99 over the existing mill rate, and you guys reduced it from the existing mill rate by $25. You add in the spread it's about $124 to the typical uh, homeowner. Okay, I think that's uh, the bottom line there. Joe, for you first, why was this move so important? Why was this tax reduction so critical? I mean, $124 is something, it's not nothing, but nevertheless, what do you say? You know, we always get into these discussions and depending on what side of the argument you're on, uh, you're on, it always gets framed as, well, it's only this much or you could save this much, right? But but really the savings, the $25 savings is not why we did it. Uh, we did it, one is because it's, we're in a tough economic time. And so if the average homeowner saves $25, the average business owner is gonna save more potentially, uh, certainly a large business would save even more. Um, in addition, um, it's just to, to slow the growth of the budget overall, right? So this year's budget number is X. Next year, if they look for a 2% increase, it's 2% on top of the X. And so every year it sort of keeps growing. So I think what we're trying to do is slow the growth of the budget overall. Yeah, um, Sam, you got some pushback in the record journal from one of the mayor's fans who wrote a letter to the editor, uh, I think it was on Monday, May 9th that said, okay, you know, we get it. You're reducing the mill rate a little bit, saving a little bit of money, but there's an accusation that all six of you who voted for this result was short-sighted. That's what it says. That's what the letter of the editor says. Um, is there a response? You don't look short-sighted, but you could be. I don't know. What do you think? Uh, so I, I did. I did see that letter, and, and I do know the letter writer, and I, I've worked with her actually, and, and I know she does care about our town. Um, but you, you got to take it for what it's worth. Uh, she does support the mayor um, and only the mayor on on everything, no matter what it is, and and um, it's not an objective opinion uh, in my mind, and and. You know, in that letter, she actually, she references the the moment a few years ago when our AAA bond rating was decreased to a AA1 uh, bond rating. And she she references how, um, you know, Moody's reasoning was because there were two operating deficits in a row. And so I guess that would be more of my concern is that if we have another budget with an operating deficit, um, but but I, I, I do not agree with her. I, I do not think we're short-sighted. I think we are weighing what is best for the taxpayers. And I think um, the majority of the council looked into it uh, and really did their homework on this budget and, and realized that what was best for the taxpayers was keeping the tax rate steady and uh, using our assets and, and other, other sources of, of funds to, to um, to, to just to keep the taxes low and to, to, to protect the taxpayers in a tough time, as Joe said, you know, we, we are uh, we are we are in the midst of uh, sky high inflation, rising gas prices, food, food prices are increasing. And so okay. we want to protect. Yeah. All right. Good. Good. Tax. Good talking point. Oh, we, we <laughs> good, excellent talking point. <laughs> but Joe, let me swing it back down to you. Um, what about this bond rating? problem. I mean, is that, is that a serious issue? Is that, well, you know, it's funny because when the bond rating went down, they cited two budget deficits as one of the items, but they also had several other items that they cited 
for example, the, you know, the, the poor economic status of the state in general, eroding tax base, you know, sort of this laundry list of items. And so we sort of laser focus on the two things that we, we feel like we can control. But, you know, the bond rating probably would have gone down with or without the budget deficits. It's more a matter of sort of the, the general economic climate. Yeah, so I, I got a little data here um, on on the operating deficits. Uh, there was an operating deficit in 2017, an operating deficit in 2018, an operating deficit in 2019. There would have been an operating deficit in, in 2020, but the Board of Ed ran a big surplus. The Board of Ed had a $2.6 million surplus. Um, and so without that, we would have had an operating deficit. As it turned out, in 2020, there was a surplus of $2.4 million. In 2021, there's another operating deficit. So over the last five years, there's track, quite a track record of operating deficits. Um, Sam, you know, back, back to you a little bit, it's sort of a, a quick answer. Is this information that I'm presenting of any relevance, any importance? Does it does it worry you at all, or how would you address it? Yeah, I mean, it does concern me, and you know, and we hope that this this budget um, doesn't you know conclude in that same way. But I, I I think we need to be very careful moving forward to to make sure that we budget properly so that this does not occur. Because you know, I do think the bond rating is of course important, um, and, and I think that's an important factor. So we need to make sure. That's not happening. Yeah, um, Joe, briefly, so how did you do it? What was, yeah, what, were, what, did, what did you do to uh, reduce the mill rate? Sure, so a couple of things. So one is we took $800,000 worth of, uh, of singular items uh, like, um, uh, like firefighting equipment. Uh, there's a list of firefighting equipment. There were some trucks for the, for the public work, some sort of big ticket items out of the budget. Um, you know, not operating expenses, but sort of single time purchases. And we allocated ARPA funds towards those. Uh, in addition, uh, the mayor had six million or so in round numbers uh, coming out of the reserve to balance the budget. So we increased that to seven and a half. Um, and then there was another item and it's escaping me right now. Yeah, it, it, it was a, a minor item. It had to do with capital on recurring and using ARPA money again. That's right. That's right. So in, in, in the general broad view is, but check me if I go wrong, uh, first Joe and then Sam, mm -hmm. um, you didn't cut expenses. What you did is use reserves and ARPA money instead of tax dollars. Is that in general a fair sum? Uh, Joe first and then Sam. In general terms, it is a fair sum. I, I think it's also important to point out that you know within every budget, there's a lot of sort of discretionary purchases. So if the mayor feels like he needs to save money, there's things he doesn't do or or so on. You know, so it, just because the council adjusts the budget by a million dollars doesn't mean you have a million dollar deficit at the end. You know, there's a lot of factors that go into that. Sam, um, yeah, address that. But while you're on mic uh, addressing that. Mm -hmm. A point was raised that there's a million dollars in a pool fund mm -hmm. that is just rotting away, gathering dust, not working for the town. The smart money says we're never going to see a pool as long as Mayor Dickinson is mayor. And that's sort of by consensus. Yet the council didn't grab that million dollars. Sure. Um, you know, I, I said this the other night that th this was uh, a tremendous learning moment for me, uh, the whole budget process. And, you know, and I'm grateful for people like Councillor Marone, who helped guide and educate me throughout this process. Um, but it was pretty clear, um, it, it, you know, even as a, a newbie, that that spending, you know, that the, the budget is maintaining the services that this town has provided in, in our previous budget. And so that's what I really uh, you know, I particularly like to see that not only were we able to maintain our tax level, but reduce it, you know, when are we, when did we ever see something like that happen? You know, taxes actually being reduced, All right. well, our services are, are maintained. And, and so the services are being maintained. And that is, uh, that's what I really like. But in terms of the, the $1 million uh, in, in that pool fund, um, you know, I, I think some of us actually hope to see that pool renovated. I, and actually more than some of us, I think the majority of us on the council want to see that pool renovated that will benefit hundreds of families in this town. And, and, and in essence, in my mind, that $1 million is a down payment 
on renovating that pool. And I think that's where it should stay so that we can actually hopefully uh, get to that moment where we do renovate our community pool. All right, I'll, I'll let that be the final word on that topic. Um, we'll have to agree to disagree. That'd be the first place I'd go. If I wanted a cool million bucks, that's where I'd go. Uh, well, no, it, but, but I know, you know, the, the save the pool crowd might be very upset. I, I, Joe, you have something on the tip of your tongue and I want, want to make sure you get it out. What, what were you going to say to I, just wanted to, I just wanted to point out that the million dollars in the pool fund didn't come from tax dollars. That came from uh, the electric division money uh, last year. So, so it's not like we taxed that money and set it aside, right? It came from the electric division. So, you know, I guess if you have $30 million in the bank rotting away or you have $1 million, you know, in this bucket, I don't really see the difference. Well, it, it started out in electric division money and then it went into the general fund, which then became tax money and then went in to the pool fund. So, but let me, let me skip ahead here. I just want to start off by saying how eye-opening this budget process has been. Uh, this has been an incredible learning moment for me as a new counselor. Uh, so, and, and it, it's certainly no easy task putting together a nearly $180 million budget. So I commend the mayor and Mr. Senna for the countless hours and hard work they have put in to this. I especially commend many of my fellow counselors, not just for their time spent on the budget, but for helping me learn and for educating me throughout our process. I'm very appreciate, appreciative of that. And I want to give due credit where it's due. Uh, Councillor Tata definitely took charge in spearheading this entire effort. You know, she, she came up with the foundation of what she was looking to do um, as she's done in other years and basically started to query everybody if we had any ideas that we wanted to add to what she was looking to do herself. Rather than doing all the heavy lifting herself, she invited everybody in and just about everybody that was available contributed. You know, to get real personal, like Sam and Autumn, from my perspective, get a pass, right? Because they're new and I have to get the sense that one's going to vote with us and one isn't. And there's a certain level of complexity to the budget that you can't pick up in one session. I would say it took me probably three full budgets to fully understand how all of this works. But, you know, to my colleagues, my other colleagues that are going to vote no, specifically Mr. Laffin and Mr. Cervoni, we go through this whole process every year. We, we talk about, you know, all these areas of the budget. We ask all these questions, but then at the end, there's no suggestions as to what you know, you want to fix. So it's like we've reached this divine level of perfection in the budget where like the mayor said it and this is now the perfect budget. It can't be improved in, in any way. So we all acknowledge the problems we have. I, I just, I wish, it's kind of like I, so my oldest son is a, I love him dearly, right? But he's, he's not a great student because he just doesn't care, right? And so you want him to do better in schools, you know, because it'll improve his situations and so on. So it's not that I get mad at these guys, it's that I face a level of disappointment because I just wish they were with us a little more on the, the solution of the problem as opposed to sitting on the sidelines and just accepting what we've been handed. Uh, I, was I was asked for ideas and opinions um, and asked if I had any questions on the budget. So I wasn't really like, I didn't really know that that's what this was entailing. So first of all, let's, you know, because, um, this is something that it seems like some people are saying that some worked on it a lot more than others. Secondly, um, this budget is not really a continuation of services in my opinion. If we were continuing services, we would still have a community pool. You know, as it's been pointed out, uh, I am new here and given what I've seen in the past couple of years, I do wonder what we are telling ourselves we're continuing to maintain when the services may actually be reduced under a budget um, such as this. So if we're going to allocate a million dollars to community pool, why is it still sitting in an account it, when it could have been in the reserves? I noticed there was, there, was, uh, there was something that we just are not seeing anywhere in this country right now, and that dirty word called compromise. Um, it, it just appears that you're, for so many people, you're risking your political fortune if you even dare to speak favorably or agree with someone from the other political party. And frankly, nothing in the proposal tonight even approaches irresponsible. Every action or activity that we do for something that is non-reoccurring, 
with any of the ARPA funds helps every single person in this town. That's my opinion. But what we came up with, um, for the, the few of us who did meet, I think the big word, and Councilor Testa said it, was compromise. So this was not my plan. Um, I had other ideas that um, other people said, no, I'm not doing that. I'll never, I'll never agree to that. And so even though I thought it was a good idea, I had to strike it. And then um, somebody would say, I could do this instead. And then maybe it's not ideal for me, but, but that's what we added. And then we come up with a compromise that I think is a good product. Is it perfect to anybody? No. I know it's certainly um, not perfect to the mayor because the mayor thinks his budget is the best budget. Um, rightfully so, that, that's his work. Um, the mayor um, sent out a email, a letter, a memo today to all the councilors that was a bit unusual. Um, one might characterize it as odd or worse, um, but I, I, it's just a couple sentences. Let me read it. You, you guys have read it, but our viewers haven't seen it yet. So let me just read that. Sam, I want to get your reaction first and then go back to Joe. Okay. Dear council members, your efforts to contact one another and reach conclusions regarding the budget is a productive approach. It would be helpful if upon reaching a conclusion and position concerning the budget, you would contact the mayor's office and discuss possibilities of compromise, Sam. If we don't make that effort, we will never know what might have been achieved. Councillor Carmody, what's going on here? What do you think? Well, I, I think that la that last sentence says says a lot. We will never know what could have been achieved. Is that what it is? What it was? Um, I, you know, to me, my takeaway from that is is that he's probably going to veto this budget. Um, you know, I hope not, but but that's my takeaway. And to his point about reaching out to him to compromise, um, he knew exactly where this council stood a week ago when we had our motions meeting. You know, he he could have reached out to the council, to Councilor Tata, who really did lead the effort to to you know make changes in this budget, or to any of these councilors. It, it, it works both ways, and he could have he could have reached out as well. So I think it's disingenuous. To kind of point the finger at the at the council and uh, <laughs> to point the finger at the council and say that we didn't reach out to him when in fact he could have he could have done the same. Joe, you've got a little uh, more history on the council than uh, Sam does. Does a mayor have a strong and persuasive track record of reaching out for compromise? I mean, clearly you know that, right? What, what's going on with his track record? <laughs> For a rookie, Sam pretty much nailed it. So uh, uh, the mayor just reaches out on nothing, nothing at all. So if we asked him to meet with us, I'm certain that he would. But outside of that, he he does not reach out. So it, it, I think it's exactly what Sam identified. I think it's kind of a bit of spoiled grapes because now this is three budgets in a row where the council has gone in a, in a different direction. So the phone works both ways. So what I'm hearing, kind of what I'm hearing, is that he's going to veto it? There goes the tax decrease, and he's going to blame it on you guys for not reaching out. Is that Sam? Quick, a quick answer there. Is that a? Yeah, I, 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 I guess so, but that's not fair. I mean, that's not that's not the right. Too sharp. I was too sharp on that one. I, I was too sharp. Joe, <laughs> no, no, is that how it's going to go? I mean, he's going to veto and then blame it on you. That's how it's going to go, and no one's going to care. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to talk about, change the subject, uh, talk about a uh, community pool, because that was also on the agenda, uh, May 10. Um, Joe, I want to go to you first and then to Sam. Give us the bare bones of sort of the bottom line, what the motion was, what it, it intended to accomplish, and what the result was, and then I'll go to Sam for commentary on that. Yeah, so, you know, I think amongst the, the six of us that voted for it, I think that we're, a number of us are sort of uneasy with the idea of using the ARPA money on the pool, but I think we're also uneasy on the idea of giving the ARPA money to sort of the, the people that are already involved in, in town government or have close relationships with town government. So I think this sets aside money that we can't spend for something else. If we could spend it on the pool, we can't force the mayor to build a pool, right? So the building the pool is probably not realistic right now, but I think it does set aside the money to, to um, potentially take it out of the, you know, the other bucket where it goes to whomever. Yeah, but I want to get to the, uh, Sam, I'll go to you at this point. I want to get to what the motion actually was. Um, 
what was moved, how much money was was involved, and and if Jason Sanders motion, I think, right? Is that sure. yeah? So we, yeah. we we voted to who allocate, voted, and then then who voted for what? Who voted? Yeah, yeah. who voted? Yeah, we, we 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 voted to allocate five million dollars of the ARP of money to go to the pool renovation, and, and the six of us who supported the budget were also the six people who voted in favor of uh, moving this money. Uh, to, to go and, and, and renovate the pool. Uh, identify those culprits, the six, and identify the So it, it was, it's the, the three Democrats, Jason Zandri, who, who put this on the agenda, uh, Vinny Testa and myself, and then Councillor Tata, Councillor Marone, and Councillor Fishbein. Okay. So, Joe, of what legal consequence is this vote? What does it matter? Well, what it matters is the, the ARPA funds can't be spent without a combination of the council and the mayor. So if the council's decided it wants to spend $5 million in the pool, this you know hangs that $5 million until we can come to some kind of a resolution. Well, I don't, I don't get it because it sounds like um, the mayor is never going to recommend the pool. And that means that money is just... It's kind of in limbo until the mayor recommends that all of it or mo almost all of it go to businesses that he claims are in need. And this pool vote is just grandstanding. Um, Sam, why don't you react to that? And we'll come back to Joe. Yeah, no, so, you know, to go back to Joe's point, you know, um, uh, you know, I think we, we would have rather spent this this money on on other things like like nonprofits and in maybe smaller projects throughout town. Um, but, but I think we felt, or, and I'll speak, well, I'll speak for myself. I, I think I felt this was really our last ditch effort to try and get this pool renovation done. Um, you know, the mayor, you know, if, if he's against the pool and doesn't ever want to have the pool renovated, he should just say that and we can move on. We can vote to sell the property, get it on the tax rolls, but you know what? He hasn't said that. And so I, you know, I think there's some of us still holding out hope and, uh, and, and, you know, I, I do think this is just a last ditch effort, you know, the final attempt to try and, and get this uh, off the ground and, and running. Well, uh, I'm gonna come back to the pool, but it kind of interfaces with the whole application process uh, for businesses and nonprofits or sort of related uh, topics. So another agenda item was a more general discussion about how to proceed and the council is still wrestling after like four months, February, March, April, and May, counting on my fingers, four months since the new council has been seated, been wrestling with the form of the application. Joe, hey, you guys are stuck in the mud. There, there hasn't really been any, any progress made on this. Why? What's the next step? Well, you know, to start with the application, it seems kind of silly anyway, like if I needed, if I owned a business and I needed an employee, you have to figure out what that person's going to do and how you're going to pay for them before you put out, you know, the, the Indeed ad or whatever to, to hire a person. So I think we need to do the, the background, the homework to figure out who's, you know, who ultimately do we want to get this money to? Is it business, is it private sector or business or um, not-for-profits or town projects? And then we need to decide if we're going to take applications, who's going to work on the applications and determine specifically which projects meet the criteria and so on. Is it the uh, is it the consultant? Is it town employees? Is it uh, members of the public? You know, there's uh, there's a lot of ways this could go down. So I think you're you're putting the cart before the horse by starting with the application. And yet, there's been no discussion, no insistence on the council that the mayor reveal who he has in mind to judge and grade these applications. Nor after four months, has the council stepped up and said this is how we want it to go down. These are the people or the positions that we want to view and judge these applications. So neither the council has come forward, the mayor hasn't come forward. How do you, how do you get to the bottom of it? How do, how do you find out what you want to find out? Well, you know, the, we started with, a, with a, a subcommittee of the council and I assumed that they would kind of work on those particulars, but they seem to come back with the application. So I think at this point, it's going to have to be a series of council meetings where we'll have to sort of hammer out these these issues. Sam, um, your thoughts on on my question? Where do you go? No one has come forward. The council hasn't come forward with who they want. They yeah, have. Okay. Let me let me just finish my thought. They haven't told the mayor. They haven't been very direct and blunt. Mayor, 
Here's who we want reviewing the application. I so move. Someone else seconds it. And there's a debate on that. That has never happened. And I don't think it's ever going to happen. I don't know. I don't know. And I, I will give credit to uh, Councillor Marone and Councillor Tata. I mean, they have brought it up, but we have not discussed it in depth and no motion has been made. Um, but, you know, Count Joe's right. You know, that is putting the cart before the horse. And, and it's a conversation that needs to be had. Um, these, these applications are, it's just, it's been a really frustrating process. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll get documents last minute or they won't be included in our packet. You know, we don't have all the information in front of us when it's being discussed. It, it's just, it's, it's, you know, there's, this, this is a lot of money and, and we are responsible for it and, and we need to do the right thing and, and, and get this right. I mean, I think people are annoyed with the council for, for you know, what seems to be dragging this out. But frankly, the mayor dragged it out for a whole year um, before we really had serious conversations about this. And now, you know, now we're being blamed so to, that we're dragging it out. But again, you know, we need to get this right because this is this is serious stuff. This is our this is. This is money that belongs to the people and, and we need to get it right. So um, have these conversations. Yeah, uh, Joe, I sense there is some interest among the counselors to fund public projects. The pool is one. I mean, but that isn't going anywhere in my view. Pool is dead. It's not going to happen. Keep the million dollars in some fund gathering dust. Hold out hope. Pass motions that are symbolic only and probably more grants. I get all that. I get all that. So there is some interest on the council to spend this money on public projects, yet there's been absolutely no serious and focused discussion as to which projects should get funded. For example, I move, because you need a motion, you need a project. I make a motion that from the ARPA money, we fund a, and I'm making this up because Vinnie Testa mentioned it, a skate park. Mm -hmm. And uh, I make that motion that we appropriate it, I, the counselor who's making the motion, have researched skate parks in Meriden, Southington, you know, Hamden, New Haven, da, 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 and so on and so forth. And they will cost about, I'm making the number up because I have not researched it, you know, $350,000. And I make that motion. Second, no one has done that or anything like that. And in the absence of the council asserting itself on public projects, you're going to talk about what Tom Laffin wants you to talk about which is applications for businesses. Respond to what I, to, to my concern. <laughs> so two responses to that. Yeah. One is, you know, the council can't unilaterally do a, a town project, right? We need the consent of the mayor. But on the other side, the $5 million we, we appropriated for the pool is exactly what you're talking about. And then the $800,000 we took out of the budget to spend with ARPA money is sort of the same thing. So I think the council has taken some positions on the ARPA money and how to spend it. Um, with, without the mayor's consent, and you know, we'll see we'll see where the where the budget goes. So, Sam, uh, I brought this scenario up with Vinny Testa when he was on the show, um, you know, last uh, last week uh, or a couple of weeks ago. And the scenario, um, I think, is what um, Tom Laffin and Vinny Cervoni and Autumn Allenson, the mayor, and Tim Ryan are looking for, and that is you approve these applications that go out to small businesses. And they say, we just want to look at them. You know, we just want to assess the need. And I'm putting need in my finger parenthesis because the applications really don't reach need. They reach losses. Even rich guys can have losses and stay rich. Um, but they just let's get the applications out. And then one day you guys cave in with a vote of five to four or something and the applications go out. And the applications come back and the mayor has in place his panel of people who are going to assess and judge and weigh these applications. And before you know it, these, they're going to put together a list. I'm making the number up of 86 businesses that want a total of thirty five million dollars. The mayor comes to you and, and fills the room, fills, fills the council chambers, presents the list of you know, these millions of dollars, identifies as, as need. People are sitting in the audience that have filled out applications and they believe their money is going to be granted. And the mayor points to you and says, how do you deny these people? And there goes whatever leverage you had on public projects, on appointing people to review and assess, 
Uh, he fills the room, it identifies his need, it goes to the record journal, and there you go. I mean, isn't the tr this the trap you're walking right into? Well, you know, I, I think that, um, I mean, I think that businesses and small businesses especially are, are the backbone of our community and all communities. And, um, and I, I, I do want to help some of these businesses that were negatively impacted by COVID. And I do think that the applications should include, um, you know, they, they should include profit and loss statements, tax returns. We need to see all the information. We, we, we need to know what hardships they've experienced uh, through the pandemic. And, and, and there has been some conversations, again, to Councillor Marone's credit and to some other councillors about setting a cap on the amount each businesses get. I think that would help spread the money around to those who really need it. Um, you know, I, I have a friend who's the first selectman in East Windsor, and they've already allocated their first tranche of, of their ARPA funds to small businesses. And the cap, and they, it actually, they've been recognized as a town that really has done a good job at doing this. And they've, they've capped it at $10,000 per business for projects and for things along those lines. And so I think if you, sit, if you put these things in place, it will prevent um, the mayor from doing the, what, what you just explained. And, and so we need to have those conversations, as you pointed out. Um, we haven't had in-depth conversations uh, on these topics, um, but they need to be had. So Sam, and then we'll go to Joe, um, you're, the cap you would vote on, insist on, want to see is 10,000 per business applicant? I, you know, I'm open, not minded. We haven't had this conversation yet, but I think that's a good starting point. Uh, I think that's a fair amount. Um, but again, you know, I haven't heard any anyone else out on this yet. So I, I do want to consider well, everyone's opinion. Let's see what mm -hmm. Joe thinks. Joe, are you in favor of a cap? And if so, how much? So I'm in favor of a cap. And again, I, I don't know that I can stipulate an amount because I'm not certain... I guess I agree with Sam, we need to have the conversation about it. Um, to go back to your other point though, about you know <clears throat> people sort of uh, um, uh, coming after the council, lobbying the council for money, it's already happening. I mean, it started months and months ago. Uh, we've been getting letters and phone calls from people from uh, different you know groups in town, lobbying for how this money is gonna get spent and for what their needs are. And, and quite frankly, all the folks, 100% of the people lobbying us are people that already have relationships with, with the, the mayor's office and with town government. So. I'm not sure who set all of this into motion, but it was someone had a concerted effort to, to rile people up to get in touch with us. Um, the form of the application changed over the last couple of weeks. And at the end of April, um, the application for business grants, and by the way, my comments are directly, directed only at the business grant program, not the nonprofit, just to, to clear that up. But at the end of April, the business grant application said, it is vital to demonstrate economic hardship. This more recent version of the grant application, that was stricken out. The administration no longer gives a hoot about economic hardship. And that's a real tell. It, it also, at the end of April, um, I sent an email to the town attorney who seems to be editing the consultant's work, I guess. And I made the suggestion that there was a question on the old version of the application that asked for a description of the losses. And um, I, I made the suggestion there should be a sister question that the applicant should describe the hardship and document the hardship. That suggestion was rejected. So the new version of the application is hardship doesn't matter. And the questions asked on the application do not direct, do not cull the fat cats from the people that are struggling, um, the rich that are you know, having a hard time with their business. It sweeps in the big guys making a lot of money. The rich guys could get richer. That's the application that Tom Laffitt wanted to bring to a vote on May 10. After, again, weakening the interest of targeting this money to the people who really need it. And so, and this is not a new position of mine. I wrote an op-ed on this, you know, back in February or March. 
I appeared in front of the uh, the subcommittee uh, that you know was formed, and I made that case, and I said the paperwork you're presenting does not match your rhetoric. Tim Ryan, uh, you know, goes to the microphone and he talks about struggling businesses. Yet the town doesn't seem to really care about them because the application sweeps in the rich guys and, and the successful businesses and lets them demonstrate their losses. For example, a loss from $500,000 net profit, 500,000 down to 250, that's a loss. That's a loss, it has nothing to do with hardship. So I wanna ask, I wanna to go to Sam first and then, and then Joe, is hardship a relevant criteria and how important is it to you? And Joe, I'm gonna exact same question to you when we swing around. How important is it to you that you cull the struggling from the non-struggling? And if it is important, and if it is a criteria, how are you gonna do it? Well, I, I completely agree with you, Mike. And again, as I said before, I, I absolutely think that money should go to those businesses that were negatively impacted. So we need to have a way in these applications that show you know, that show us or, or the deciding body what, you know, what hardship these businesses experienced because of COVID. And, and so it needs to be explained. It needs to, we need to see it through their tax returns, their profit and loss statements, other documents, um, but that needs to be a factor in the criteria that we use to decide whether they get money or not. Um, Joe, before you answer, um, Sam used the word losses again as if losses and hardship, and Sam, we're gonna come back to you to clean this up, but as if losses and hardship are the same and they're absolutely different. And that's the problem with the applications. They conflate losses with hardship and they're totally different concepts. Joe, so the question I asked Sam is now to you. Yeah, I, I think it's a little unfair when you talk about hardship versus loss because loss is an economic term, right? In the way that we understand it. and. Hardship is more of an emotional term, you know, attempting to reach some sort of emotional conclusion. So I think with the pandemic, everyone's suffered a hardship, right? Um, you know, I worked in an office, now I work from home. Now my, my heating and electricity bill went way up. So I have a hardship. Well, not really because I'm not paying for gas to go to the office. So it's, you know, anyone can prove a hardship if you, everyone has a sob story, right? And so, you know, you hear things about, you know, you have to listen to the stories and so on. And everyone has a hard story related to the pandemic. You know, your dog died during the pandemic. Does that make your hardship Worse than someone else's hardship, uh, and you know it, it may, but I'm saying I don't think it's it's fair to use the word hardship. I think losses is sort of a, an economic term, and we can kind of wrap our heads around that. So, you know, if the goal is to save struggling businesses, my concern is what if the business was struggling before the pandemic and then struggled during the pandemic? You know, the the, the economy has a way of of uh, weeding out businesses that don't need to exist. Right? There's no demand for their product, or they can't deliver it at the price that's appropriate for the market. You know, and so on. So. There's a part of me that thinks that who we assign the ARPA money to works against, you know, sort of the the, the natural ebb and flow of the economy. Um, so that's why I, I sort of take an issue with the idea of hardship. I think we need to define a little more what we're looking to do. Yeah, um, I want to um, I want to play a little clip of uh, Tim Ryan who came to the to the microphone, and uh, he talked about someone uh, a business in Wallingford that was experiencing a hardship. And I think that, uh, and it's not the first time I've said that, extremely manipulative because he's using someone who's experiencing hardship to open the door so people that are not experiencing a hardship can absorb a lot of this money, thereby taking it away from nonprofits, uh, community-wide projects, uh, and businesses that, are, that really need it. And before we play that clip, just another editorial comment um, is when the reviewing committee looks at these applications, they're going to look at criteria and they're going to say the town expressly does not want us to consider hardship. It struck that criteria out. Therefore, we, the reviewing committee, are going to judge the millionaires on the same basis as we're going to a uh, 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 judge the businesses of those who are struggling to get by. And if that happens, it's the doing of the council who goes along with it. It's you can take a stab at putting hardship in as a criteria or not. 
Let's hear Tim Ryan. And while you think about my comment, Joe, let's hear what Tim Ryan has to say. Here we go. Three, two, one. I know you are a very engaged council. I'm a very engaged economic developer. I talk to a lot of businesses. I would implore you, when you're put, putting the fine tune elements on the application, do not exclude the opportunity to hear the stories. Some of them are going to wrench your heart. All right, we've got some businesses. I'll share one example. One example. Manufacturer on North Plains Industrial Road. Going concern, good business before COVID. His words, COVID shot me in the head. As I started to recover, my legs were cut off by supply chain issues and material pricing. Five months behind on his rent, now he is paying current. He was unable to make up the five months. And now his landlord is getting a little itchy. Right? That's one story. Sam, you heard what Tim Ryan said. You heard my comments. Um, I was rather direct. Uh, it's only an hour show. I don't have time to sugarcoat what I'm thinking. Your reaction to what I said and your reaction to uh, Tim Ryan's speech at the microphone. Sure. So, yeah, I, you know, I, I think what he says uh, is something that should be taken into consideration. And, you know, um, I, I personally want to see um, this money be used for projects that, that will help businesses improve their business model, expand possibly. But, you know, I, I would be open-minded to, to, to what Tim said regarding, you know, back rent and, and that sort of thing. You know, I, I guess my big concern is with giving money to businesses, they had the opportunity to uh, get money through the economic injury disaster loan through PPP and other programs. And so, you know, that, that's something also that we need to take into consideration because there were well over a hundred million dollars worth of federal programs, money given to businesses here in Wallingford already. Um, so, you know, we, we need to really hone in on what we want to do with, with this money. Um, and we haven't done that yet. So Joe, um, if you would give us uh, your reaction to Tim's, uh, video, Tim Ryan's video clip, and my comments, and when you're done, morph into your thoughts on the fire department and start from the beginning on that on that topic. But first, go to, to you know to Tim's comments and mine about ARPA. Yeah, so you know Tim's comments. I think it goes exactly what you're saying about hardship. I mean, that the person you could be talking about could be Elon Musk, who allegedly you know bought three businesses and then he couldn't pay his rent because he had all this money tied up in, in different things. So you know, it, no one's going to consider Elon Musk having had a hardship during the pandemic, right? So it's that it's exactly that kind of story. So, you know, if you if you take it, you know, I'm a claims adjuster, right, by trade. So I hear sob stories all, all day long. So it's kind of like everyone has a sob story, right? And so, but when you break them down, you know, you have to separate the wheat from the chaff. So I don't, you know, Elon Musk is maybe not the guy I want to give our, our ARPA money to. Um, you had some uh, uh, some thoughts about a set of, putting a set of independent eyes on the fire department because they've been in some financial turmoil over the last few years, um, adding dramatically uh, to their budget. So this is a complete change of topic here. We're talking about Joe Marone on the fire department and your remedy. Joe, what's, what did you have in mind? And then we'll go to Sam for a reaction. Yeah, so, so the, the problems, um, you know, as you know, in 2020, I believe it was, the fire department went about $600,000 over in the, in the their, um, overtime budget or in the reserve, uh, the reserve budget. Um, based on some staffing changes that they had done. And then we had a meeting shortly thereafter, you know, to say that everything was great in the fire department. So we went over budget, but now everything's great. So they kept the money in the budget year after year though. So we're essentially running the fire department off of this, uh, the reserve overtime budget. Um, and now I'm getting, I'm hearing from firefighters that have, have concerns about staffing and public safety and some sort of other issues. So I'm not a firefighter myself, right? So I guess I would feel better if we would have a, a set of independent eyes, look at the fire department, and tell us is the staffing model like if everything's perfect then everything's perfect and we can tell the firefighters that they need to you know be quiet and and, and do their jobs but if everything's not perfect then, then we need to fix it so you know the mayor campaigns on public safety a lot of us campaign on public safety this is just a, it's a big issue and i just i want to make sure that as a council we have our arms wrapped around it before we you know we keep um this sort of staffing model going quick answer on, on this clarification and then we'll go to sam who are these independent eyes that you're talking about yeah, so there's companies, there's consultants that do fire department reviews, like staffing model reviews, they can work on like a five-year plan. 
So I talked to some fire chiefs about it to get some fire chiefs outside of Wallingford to get some ideas. Uh, I believe they did a study in Southington not that long ago. And so you can kind of set up the parameters of what you want them to look at, but they can look at your whole department from top to bottom, from you know equipment to capital improvements, staffing, whatever, whatever your desire is. And then they'll sort of give you recommendations after reviewing your department. Sam, what do you think of, what do you think you know, of Joe's idea? You know, keep it in mind. I don't think this anything like this has ever been done before. I don't know. No, no. I, you know, I, I think that um, you know, I think the fire department is is a it's a pretty dynamic department that provides an excellent service to our town, and I know that that's not being argued here. Um, I, I, you know, to Joe's credit, he reached out to me, and we we haven't connected yet. I, I do need to know more about this, but I, I think that um, it's something that's worthwhile discussing and. And frankly, you know, the mayor actually seemed to his credit um, that he or he indicated that he would be willing to fund the study. Um, so I think this is a real possibility. I think it's probably going to happen. Um, who's going to bring this up again, Sam, uh, to you and then to Joe? How does this come up again? I would imagine Joe puts it on the council agenda and, and we yeah. have a discussion and, and uh, vote on it. Um, Joe, do you have an idea of the cost? Not, uh, no, not really. I mean, the, um, you know, I throw out the idea of 50,000 at the, at the last uh, council meeting based on some information I had, but, uh, but that's nowhere near a concrete cost. Um, and to address something you said earlier about this not having happened before, it hasn't, but when I was on the Board of Ed, uh, we had a consultant review of our special ed department. Uh, we've had transportation reviews done. So um, maybe not on the town, in the general government side, but certainly on the Board of Ed side, they've done things like this, uh, multiple, you know, many times. And um, I would like to have an independent review of our pension investment policy, frankly, <laughs> but that's another episode for another day. Um, let's wrap it up. We're running out of time. Uh, everyone collect your final thoughts on anything you want to talk about. Usually this que question, this open-ended is the toughest, but Sam, I'm gonna go to you first. We covered a ton of ground, you know, budget, ARPA, pools, fire departments, um, You in, in your talk, in, in front of the council, you said what a learning experience it was, and you were grateful to everyone that that helped you out. But sort of bring it all together with what your final thoughts are for this show. Sure, I, I think I think we passed a a, a smart, responsible budget, and I, I hope the mayor does not veto it. I think it's it's the right budget for this time in Wallingford. And then I guess my other my other thing that I would want to mention is the council really needs, and we all need to get together and figure out this ARPA stuff because it, it is, uh, it's vitally important that we get this right. But we also need to get it done and we should get it done soon because there are people who really are, you know, looking to use this money for, for good to benefit the community and to benefit, you know, the businesses that, that were, were harmed during COVID. So we need to get it done. Joe, your final closing statement for the show. You know, I just I just want to say I'm energized by the, what's happened on the council so far. Uh, Sam has been an excellent new, new counselor. Uh, he's picked up stuff really quick, you know, and sort of how like, the council works. And this has been a difficult beginning of a session. But I think with the, you know, we've had six voices working together, uh, sort of in bipartisan support of, of for Wallingford. So I think it's I think it's a good thing for the people of this town, and I hope we can continue. Let's make that the final word, guys. Thanks for coming on the Citizen Mike Show, and thank our viewers for uh, for watching. We also thank WPAA TV, who um, puts the Citizen Mike Show on their channel nine at night on weekdays. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks again, guys. See you next time around. Thanks, Thank Mike.